right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, and we do have a few groups joining us for the first time, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. A thing that today's program epitomizes all three of all in one nice little package, which is pretty cool. We'll get to that in just a second, but I wanted to note again that this February, we are going bigger than we've ever gone before in our theme of celebrating and showcasing incredible women in science and exploration. By the end of the month, including our epic 50 program series on the 12th through the 14th, our Women Blaze Trails Fest, we will have done over 80 programs with incredible speakers from across the planet. I think we broadcast from 27 countries this month, which is crazy. So thank you guys to all our teachers joining us live, joining us on YouTube. I know it's a really unusual time to be a teacher, but it is such a thrill to get to showcase such amazing people to you guys. So today, Hey, we are going to one of my favorite places on this planet, one of the, our, our favorite places that exploring by the seat of your pants generally. We are going to Madagascar. And we are going there not to look about lemurs, um, which we typically do. We do a lot of great lemur stuff. We are diving into these seas off Madagascar to go searching for the largest fish on this planet, the whale shark, my favorite creature in the ocean. So I am so excited to introduce to you guys Stella Diamond. She is going to talk about her Madagascar whale shark project, uh, an inspirational story that led to her doing the amazing work she does today to chart, understand, and help conserve this amazing creature. So without further ado, Stella, thank you so much for joining us. And now you can take us away and dive right in with your talk. I can't wait to hear it, just like the kids. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here today. And it's actually really important for me to raise awareness about what I do and hopefully inspire more of you guys and especially girls to do what I do and to go and save the animals you love. So hopefully my talk and my story inspire you. Uh, so my name is Stella. I'm 31. I'm currently in Belgium, um, but I usually work in Madagascar due to the pandemic. I'm stuck here since a year now um, with my family, but um, I still get to do a lot of work on, on the project. It's actually quite full on. Um, and since five years now, I run my own foundation. It's a nonprofit called the Madagascar Whale Shark Project. Um, so yeah, on this story, uh, sorry, on this uh, picture here, you see me free diving. So that means kind of um, diving without um, you know, oxygen, just holding your breath. Uh, next to a whale shark is one of my favorites. He's called Raphael. And uh, it's one of my favorite pictures because it just, <laughs> it shows how amazing it is, right? To do the work, the work I am lucky to be doing, uh, diving in the sea, in blue sea, um, with wild animals um, in beautiful ocean, but it's not so easy. So I'm gonna talk you through um, how I got there. So first, where is Madagascar? So I'm not sure how many of you in the US are familiar with where Madagascar is. It's in red on the picture, so it's in the Indian Ocean. Uh, it is in Africa, but it's an island. It's actually the fourth biggest island in the world, and it's really huge. <laughs> like, it will take you days to cross it, actually, probably weeks or months. Um, I first went to Madagascar a while ago, um, and Actually, I made a mistake there, it's 2011, and then I went back again in 2014. But now, 10 years ago, I went there for the first time after finishing to study. And um, I discovered the local life there, and um, I worked with the WWF for six months in a remote community with fishermen. So it was really difficult to see how dependent people are on nature. Um, they need to go fishing every day to get food. They need to walk lots of distance to get water um, and it really um, made me think about my own life and how I could help. Equally I've always been um, in love with animals and always attracted to the sea so slowly things were kind of you know starting to yeah make more sense in my head and I always knew I would go back and set up a project there. Um, and before that I studied biology and then, um, sorry, <laughs> I lost my track there. I'll go. I'll come back to my career after. But the main point was Madagascar. Um, it is an incredible place. Um, actually, 90% of all the animals there, they're only found on the island of Madagascar, like the lemurs, this fluffy animal there. They're incredible animals, very specialized. They all have different habitats they live in, and also lots of reptiles, like this little chameleon. Actually, there's now an even smaller chameleon that was discovered, I think, last month. So it's really a special place for all the terrestrial biodiversity. 
Um, so back to my career and then I'll come back to Whale Sharks to understand more how it all happened. Um, then after I went to Madagascar at that time I told you about, um, I continued my experience in the field to earn more experience as a biologist. So that's me <laughs> tracking a baboon in Namibia. Um, so initially I was into primates, um, but then I realized it's really quite hot <laughs> on land and I enjoy being at sea more. Um, but also I realized there was a lot more work to be done. Um, then I crossed the Pacific Ocean in 2015, I worked on a plastics project and that's when I started really enjoying to lead expeditions and manage projects and also really felt at home at sea. And then after that I went back to Madagascar um, kind of on a break in between different jobs and that's when I saw my first whale shark um, and it looked like this. So it's really an incredible sight to see. Uh, to see this animal um, and I'll explain you why they're so amazing and why they need saving. Oops. Um, so whale sharks are the world's biggest fish. So you can see on this graph when they're born, so at the bottom, they can be, they're tiny, like half a meter. So that's like this. Um, and then they slowly grow, they reach maturity. You can see at about nine meters. So that's where the little diver is kind of at that stage. And then that's only when they can reproduce. So it takes about 30 years. So that's pretty much my age. <laughs> it takes, takes them that long to be able to have babies. And then from then onwards, they're still growing. So they can reach, um, it's been recorded 18 meters, but probably it's even 20 meters long. Um, so they can reach that size. And you can imagine they reach, you know, a hundred plus years when they get so big. So it's amazing how they can be born so small and then they get so, so, so big. <laughs> Um, if you don't believe me, here are some pictures. Um, sadly, I wasn't there to see it myself, but it's from a colleague in the Philippines. So like I told you, you can hold them in your hands when they're babies. They're really that small and they're actually a bit useless. They can't really swim. And it's probably why, you know, um, actually when they're born, there's about 400 of them. Um, and it's probably why there's so many because most get eaten or lost or things like that. So there's very low survival rate that we, that we think. And then look how big they get. So that's a picture also from a colleague. I haven't <laughs> been to the Galapagos Islands, oops, yet. Um, but that's a picture of a bigger, mature, you know, adult whale shark. So you can see next to the diver is really huge. Um, so that's just to tell you a bit more about their, you know, <laughs> the live stages. Um, where do we find whale sharks in the world? So mainly in the tropical seas, there's actually 19 countries where you can find whale sharks in the wild. There's also places where they keep them in aquariums, but I'm not gonna talk about that. And they're mainly in the you know warm oceans. Um, and that's where Madagascar is, so you see it again. Um, so here's a picture, sorry, a video, hopefully this works, of how it looks like to be in the water with a whale shark. And that's where a whale shark is feeding. So that's really um, the key aspect of my research is we find whale sharks when they're feeding. So you can see it's at the surface and it's just kind of munching away. You can see there's other fish on the sides, but actually they're just also feeding on the same type of fish. So what the whale shark is eating, you actually don't see it. It's microscopic. It's really, really small fish. Here it's coming really close. <laughs> um, when it's got the mouth closed, it's not feeding. There it's feeding again. So it's kind of just munching on the surface and together with the other fish, the other tuna fish, they're all pushing the little tiny microscopic food um, to the surface. And that's in those moments we're lucky as humans because we cannot dive as deep as whale sharks. Um, that's when we're lucky to, to spot the whale sharks from the surface and to do our research. Oops. Um, yeah, so that's a, micro, a picture from my microscope. It shows you like enlarged. So this is usually, you cannot see this. Um, with your eyes, but it's what the whale shark is eating. So it's plankton and it's also really small fish and shrimps um, and krill also. So it's very like food at the bottom of the of the food chain um, that's microscopic, but because whale sharks are filter feeders, as you saw in the previous video, they feel like whales. They will open their mouth, um, kind of absorb all the water and then the water comes out of the gills and then they keep what's um, edible for them and that's how they feed. That's why we call them whale sharks because they're like a whale but they're still in the shark family. Um, but of course um, there's a few problems <laughs> and a few threats for whale sharks. As you've seen when they feed at the surface um, they're very focused on their food <laughs> and, um, and they don't really pay attention to what's happening around them and often that leads to boat collisions. Um, this is a picture from 
from a place in Mexico where, where there's a lot of tourism and because all the boats and all the tourists want to swim with the whale sharks, that leads to some scarring and can be often fatal. You can see on this picture, it's really cutting through the skin. Whale sharks actually have a really thick skin. It's about 10 centimeters for a juvenile whale shark that we see in Madagascar, about seven meter long, and still the boat engines and props will cut through. So that's one, one issue that um, they face in the ocean. Another problem is the plastic pollution. As I'm sure you're aware, it's becoming quite widespread in the ocean. And, um, and sadly, whale sharks, because they feed at the surface, whenever there's a plastic bag or some other microplastics floating, they will just absorb it. Like I explained to you, they just kind of have their mouth open and whatever is there, they just take it in. They're not looking at what they eat because they know they'll find the little plankton they need. And uh, quite often it means um, whatever is floating at the surface will get stuck um, in the digestive system and, and kill them. So that's a huge problem for marine life, for cetaceans, for um, turtles, but also for filter feeders like, like whale sharks. Another problem, um, and then I promise it's going to get more positive, is um, all the big fishing industry. So um, in this picture, you see a net from a tuna boat being dragged up. In there, you see some tunas. And sadly, often tunas and whale sharks, they feed together, like you saw in my video. They like the same kind of food. Um, but it means that if lots of tunas would be caught quite often, well, we don't know, actually, because this happens you know, in the high seas where there's a lot of illegal fishing as well. But quite often, whale sharks are targeted and then they end up in this massive net. And because they're so big, it's a big, yeah, lots of hassle to get them out of the net. So quite often, they're just caught. Um, and then that's also <laughs> another threat. Uh, it's entanglement. So in this picture, um, you have a whale shark with a fishing rope. Often it's from, um, it's from fishing, but it can be from, you know, anything from the big boats at sea. And then they will kind of get stuck on them. And um, maybe you've seen on social media, sometimes divers rescue them um, and cut the ropes. But even so, like in this case, we did that last year. We had a, a beautiful shark that was, I mean, it's, it's this one. And uh, you can see here, we've removed the, um, the net, but you can still see the white scarring. And actually, you can see in this picture, it's kind of, yeah, um, heard the... Um, the gills of the shark, so it means it cannot feed properly. It's really skinny on this picture. You can see all of its skeleton pretty much. Uh, it's not cartilage actually, but just to, to make you understand better. And so that means they can't even feed um, you know, properly anymore. So it's really a big problem. And they drag these nets and ropes for months often because um, they stay so deep and we don't see them. Um, so all these things have made um, the whale shark an endangered species by the IUCN Red List. So that's kind of the main um, institution that um, rates just how threatened the species is. As you can see on this list, it is quite bad for the whale sharks. Endangered is a, is a bad one. The next step is critically endangered. So that means it's, it's really, really scary. And then after that, it's extinction. So that means these animals are just not going to be present uh, in nature. So yeah, <laughs> it is quite worrying. And that's all these reasons have led me to um, dedicate my life now to saving these amazing species. So a bit more on what we do. Uh, yeah, that's, so that's kind of the, the main fact from uh, what I was saying. Actually, the, the data from different population sites say that um, across the world, um, in the last 75 years, you know, there's only half as many whale sharks as there used to be. Because the whale shark research is still so new, um, it's difficult to be, you know, completely sure. It, whale sharks are still very difficult to study. And yeah, I'll explain you why <laughs> now. Um, so how did I start a project there? So when I went in 2014, I realized um, there's actually all these boats going out to see whale sharks. And as you can see on the video, the whale sharks are there at the surface feeding. So it was actually quite easy to just think, wait, how about we get some scientists on these boats or we train some tourists to collect data uh, when they see sharks. So um, very simply, I collaborated with some um, tourism operators there. Initially one, now we have a lot more. Um, and then whenever they were going out with the boats, I went with them and I took some pictures, um, which I'm gonna talk about now. And um, the great thing was that because it's so easy um, to swim next to a whale shark, like I said, they're at the surface feeding, like in this picture, um, it's Pierre, another shark. And this is my friend Fanny, who's trying to 
well, who's trying, who's just enjoying swimming with the whale shark now. But um, what we do really in the field is called citizen science. It means we train uh, normal people who have no scientific training. And then um, through them taking pictures when they're at sea for fun, you know, on the holiday, um, they will actually collect data that can help us. So that means uh, we don't need scientists. We just need people who are happy to be at sea. And um, and that way we cut costs and also we get a lot more data very easily and we involve a lot more people. Um, so now how do we collect data on whale sharks? So the main thing we do is called photo identification or photo ID. Basically, uh, we just take a picture on of each shark, but always the same picture. So it looks like this. Um, I'm just going to close my window because my dog is going a bit crazy. Here we go. <laughs> So in this picture, um, it's a whale shark swimming, as you can see. But the really important part is the one in the red square. And it's basically from after the gills and above the pectoral fin, so the fin you can see below. That's kind of the area we always target with our photos. Um, whale sharks all have different spots. And actually, that's through research. It's been kind of defined as the standard um, part that all scientists would take as a photo. Um, it's easy because it's a part that doesn't really move as the shark grows. And um, and the coolest thing is that all the dots are different for each whale shark. So even though they look they look all the same <laughs> when you don't know them, actually, um, it's like, you know, the the fingerprints we all have, um, we can we can compare them and differentiate them just by the dots. Um, so actually, it's really useful to study whale sharks that way because we don't need to touch them or to harm, harm them. We can just take a picture. And then that way we can, you know, we know if we've seen that shark before, if it's come back, if it's a new shark. Um, so now, for example, this is another shark. Um, if you really look inside this square, you can see, for example, just under the fish, it's called the remora. It's a fish that always <laughs> stays with the sharks and follows them around. Just below, you can see this, we call it a pizza dot. So this particular shark is called Michel. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> and he has this very distinctive pizza dot. You can see it's, it looks like a pizza. It's just got a cross in between um, here. And just by looking uh, for this pizza dot, each time we see a shark, we can tell if it's Michel or not. If I go back to the previous picture, you can see it's not there. Instead, this is Ernest, <laughs> and he has these three kind of very distinctive line just above the fifth wheel. So all sharks have different dots, and they're the same for their life, and they never change. Here is another shark. You can see it doesn't have the ones from Ernest. It doesn't have the one from Michel. It's got these three different ones. Um, and that way, basically, we just kind of collate all these different photos in a catalog on the laptops. And each time we go at sea, sometimes we see one shark, sometimes three, sometimes 10, sometimes 15. We always try to have these pictures. Um, of course, it requires a bit of training, but it's very easy. You just need to be a good swimmer and be dedicated. And then quite, quite easy, you'll get a picture. Um, so this is, ooh, this is a very cool story just from the photo ID. So in 2007, so before I was even there, there was a diver who took a picture of this shark. And then he put it on this global database online that we all use now as scientists. And then my assistant in 2018, uh, Leon, who works with for me, who's Malagasy, um, he took another ID and we realized that it's actually the same shark. Um, so for me, that's really just so awesome. We can, you know, we're able to recognize a shark that we don't know where we call them Adam, obviously, because he was the first one um, in the database in 2007. Um, so we don't know where Adam's been for 11 years, but we know he's come back. And um, he hasn't really grown, if you're wondering. He's still pretty much the same size. Um, but he's you know, still using the area for feeding, and he's still coming back. So it just really shows how important this feeding area is for whale sharks. We also record um, little scars and nicks and all these unique marks that whale sharks have on them. Like us, you know, they've had uh, boat collisions or life history, um, a bunch of things happen to them that we don't know about. And then um, that makes them, you know, more easily recognizable for us <laughs> humans. Instead of looking at all the dots, we can just look at the scars and easily recognize them. Michel, who I talked about, he has a cut tail here. Um, and then these, other sharks all have, you can see, different scars. 
And they all have names. As you can notice, they have a data code. So MD is for Madagascar, and that's the number in the database. We have we have a lot now. We have nearly 450. And, uh, and then they all have names, depending on who saw the shark first. So like I was saying now, through all of this work, and then after, of course, there's the less fun part of just looking at the dots on the laptop <laughs> when it's very hot and you just want to want to go have a drink after a long day at sea. And um, and for this, we rely, like I said, on the volunteers and all the tourists. And we have a, a program now allowing people to come and volunteer with us. And then at evening, they will spend you know quite a lot of time looking at the pictures. And through that, we've identified more than 400 sharks. So compared to zero, when I first started five years ago, it's um, it's really nice to see that actually this area is clearly very important for whale sharks and that the whale sharks keep coming back. Um, so now a bit more on the technical, cool side of things. I'm going to try to make this easy. So uh, on this picture, it's me swimming with a, one of the bigger sharks. It's a female. Um, and you can see she has a, a satellite tag, we call them. So it's, um, it's like a little GPS tracker um, that we fix on the shark. Here's a better picture. And actually, it's got like a little razor blade that goes inside the skin. Um, but don't worry, it doesn't hurt the shark. It's like a mosquito bite for them because their skin is so so thick, like I explained. And then there's a little rope. Basically, the point of the rope is to allow the satellite tag to float at the surface. So whenever the shark is feeding, like I remember in the video at the beginning, um, the tag will float automatically at the surface. And that way, it will interact with whichever satellite is in the sky at that time and say, OK, um, now Michelle is at this GPS position. And that's a really useful tool for a scientist um, because we're able to track their movements and know if they keep using the area, if they move elsewhere without having to follow them. We just, we just need the tag to be at the surface, so we need the shark to be feeding. Um, it is still quite difficult, <laughs> this technology, because whale sharks uh, travel huge distances and the tags, um, they're not happy when they go deep. Whale sharks, I didn't say, but they can go to at least 2,000 meters deep and sometimes they will stay there for months. So if a tag stays <laughs> that deep without um, coming back to the surf and transmitting, often it's just going to stop working. So this is some of the data we collected. It's from a publication that we released a few years ago. Um, just to explain you very briefly, you can see this is the island of Madagascar, like I explained. And all the different dots are a shark. So in red, it's one shark. Um, in orange, it's another shark. Actually, the orange shark is the one I was swimming next to. Uh, here, it's that one. <laughs> and you can see she was here a lot. There's lots of dots. And then um, she kind of went here. And when you see there's um, no dots next to each other, for example, here, that means she was underwater. That's why the, the tag wasn't transmitting. And then here she came out again. She fed a bit, then underwater again. So it's really interesting to see that actually, as you can see in this picture, most whale sharks, they will stay in our study site. That's where we based, with the star is. But then after the season or after a few weeks, um, they all do their different things. So one shark, he came here, and then the tag <laughs> stopped transmitting. Uh, Michel, I think he's the pink one. Uh, we barely see him. He just stayed there and ate the whole time. So he's very resident. And then this other shark here, who is called Jack, I remember, he did a crazy trip. Look, he followed the shelf here. So you can see the bathymetry it basically shows here the color of the sea. It shows how deep the sea is. And um, as you can see, you know, here, the lighter part, it's zero to 200 meters. So it's quite shallow. And whale sharks are like that. That's usually where they find their food. So Jack probably, he just ate. As you can see, lots of dots. He just ate. And then here, at the bottom of Madagascar, he stopped eating. And that's the last point we had, the last news we had of him. Um, and then the tag stopped, stopped transmitting. And just that distance is about, you know, 3,000 kilometers. So it's a really long distance. And actually, two years after, in 2018, we saw Jacques here again. <laughs> we don't know, you know, which way he came back, but we saw him again from the photo ID. So combining all these methods together really it's really helpful and insightful into the whale shark's life. So Jacques, in two years at least, he's covered 7,000 kilometers. So yeah, it just blows my mind how, <laughs> how amazing these animals are. 
Another thing we do with the tags, um, this is a zoomed in picture of our study area. And um, the two green boxes, they show you the marine protected areas. So in Madagascar, sadly, we don't have many. But in the area, we have two. So that means no fishing is allowed and whale sharks cannot be fished. Sadly, they're not protected in Madagascar yet, hoping to get there soon. Um, but you know, if they're there, they're safe. So we still have a lot of work to do. And actually, we're working on having a protected area now in between these two areas. Um, and yet to explain you a bit more, the red basically shows you where the whale sharks were feeding a lot. So where we got a lot of tagging transmission. So you can see here, you have some orange that shows some feeding, but less, but really the, the red is where whale sharks are feeding all the time and we get lots of tags uh, transmitting. So here clearly is really the key focus area where we're focusing our efforts. So it's nice to know we're <laughs> studying the right, you know, the right site. Um, and, and they keep coming back. So it's just more data and information to confirm that it's an important area and that we need to keep you know, pushing for protection and, and uh, empowering people there to care about the whale sharks. Which brings me to the kind of the last part of my presentation. Um, so a big part of what we do, aside from all the science that I explained to you, is that we share our knowledge. And that's really important as a scientist um, and as a team that we, you know, we share with everyone pretty much who comes through, whether it's tourists, whether it's uh, the government, whether it's kids, I'll show you more about what we do. Um, we share what, what I just shared with you that, you know, this area is critical for whale sharks, they're in danger, they grow very slowly, this is why we need to protect them. Um, so for this, we, we give lots of briefings on the boat that we partner with, uh, we give presentations, and we've also um, initiated a code of conduct. So it's basically um, a set of regulations I mean, initially it was just kind of rules, but slowly it's it's now in the process of becoming official law in Madagascar. So also really hoping this comes true because it will be huge for us. But um, you can see here at the bottom, it's just a set of rules, basically uh, protecting the shark from collisions with boats, from people touching the shark. They don't like that. And it's quite dangerous because they will react and um, so that they can keep feeding and keep being undisturbed and wild because that's at the end we want to protect what they do and because they come to this area to feed it's really important they keep feeding so they can grow so in this picture um you can see two tourists you know not blocking the shark allowing it to be allowing it to swim while enjoying and taking pictures and that's exactly the kind of behavior we we push for um we also since two years nearly three now, <laughs> we initiated a, a program with, uh, with kids and children in Madagascar, uh, mainly educating them about plastic and why we need to reduce or, um, you know, pol polluting the sea with plastic and why it's important to recycle and sort the litter. It's a big problem in, in poor countries. And uh, for this, we recruited Bruno, who you see in the picture, who's a great, great educator and who will run different activities with the kids, beach cleanups, uh, school programs, all raising awareness about why we need to protect this special place for whale sharks and for other animals, for the turtles and the whales that also use this, this area. Um, a big part of my job is to also share this same knowledge with um, you know, the government and the ministries and people actually having the power to make decisions. So um, so I go speak to, this is an association of guides. Um, I go speak to the tourism office, to all these people, um, you know, raising awareness again of why this area is important, why we need regulation and why we need support so that everyone follows these rules at sea, not just the people who like whale sharks, but everyone, <laughs> like it's a general rule and that hopefully will shape the way tourism is growing there so that um, whale sharks can keep coming back, keep feeding while attracting tourists, while, you know, um, making it um, profitable for people there so they can earn money from the tourism, but at the same time, it's also respecting the whale sharks. Um, so that's the end. Uh, so my main message is, Protect what you love, uh, which is what I've always, you know, um, <laughs> hoped to do. And I'm sure you all have an animal or a cause that's dear to you. So I encourage you to, you know, really become involved in in doing more for that cause. Um, whether it's you know to really care about the plastic you use, or it's to I don't know go veggie, or it's very personal what we all love. But we have a responsibility and a and um, a strength to you know make 
um, make a difference. And that's that's really um, a chance we have as as this new generation. Um, and everything is possible. So I hope uh, my talk inspired you and um, go out there and do what you love. <laughs> Fantastic. Stella, that was so, so much fun. The feedback on YouTube has been tremendous. We've got at least other six other classes from Illinois, Ontario, California there as well. So it's a full house, many hundreds of kids from across the continent and welcome in to all of you. Stella, if you want to come out of screen share and join us, you can see us again for a little conversation. That <laughs> That'd be nice. Um... I'm no hurry. Um, and then what we'll do is I'm going to take a few questions from YouTube. The teachers are already there. I've been sharing a lot, which is great. Uh, but what, we're going to start with Ms. Stouffer's class, joining us in Lacanto, Florida. So Ms. Stouffer's group, come on in if you want to kick us off with a question and go for it. Hi, my name is Noah. And how, how can we help the whale sharks? <laughs> no, I love the question, man. Yeah, good question. So um, there's many ways you can help whale sharks. I would say the first is really try to watch your plastic. So, um, you know, try to reuse, reduce, recycle. Um, don't throw plastic or waste because it will end up in the sea and it will threaten whale sharks, but also all the other species. So that's a really easy step. Never use plastic bags, all of this, you know, try to be wary of this. And then also, I guess, if you ever get the chance to swim with the shark, uh, make sure you go with, um, you know, a tourism operator that um, respects the whale sharks and don't touch, don't ever touch a wild animals or whale sharks, I would say. <laughs> It's a really good message, and we hear this a lot from a lot of people uh, across the world. Whatever the animal is of interest, give animals space, respect them, don't touch them in the wild. Those things really make a positive difference. And if you see situations in Madagascar or anywhere where someone has like an animal on their shoulder and they're taking selfies with it, don't go to them. Don't share those pictures either, because that can really help. You know that that sort of action does a, a real disservice to the animals and wildlife of a lot of places around the globe. So great question to kick us off, Miss Stover's group. So Miss Brewer's class and Miss First class, your guys' mics aren't working, so you're gonna have to type questions in the chat bar. Everybody else, I will come live to you guys. Miss Brewer's class is doing that right now, and Kai wants to know how friendly they are, Stella. <laughs> Uh, they're very friendly. So the thing I didn't say is whale sharks don't have teeth like the other sharks. They have very small teeth that you wouldn't see. Um, so they kind of bite you. And it's it's really a big um, misconception. It's, it's not true that sharks are dangerous to start with. They're dangerous if you don't follow the rules, but um, they will happily just live their shark life if you don't disturb them. Um, but whale sharks, you know, there's, there's never a risk they will bite you. So actually, they're quite friendly. And sometimes they really... <laughs> come a bit too close and we you've seen in the video we have to move out with the, with our cameras because they they're just very focused on their food but equally they're very big so sometimes they can they can hurt you or they can slap you with their with their tail because they do take a lot of space yeah great question guys um let's head to Sudbury Ontario four hours north of me I'm Miss Lozell's class if you guys have a question for us come on in yes one of my students wants to know the lifespan of a whale shark the lifespan. So recent research now has shown that it's estimated to 150 years. They can live to at least 150 years. Um, the problem with all these wild animals is you never know, <laughs> you know, unless you follow them for 150 years, you will not know how long they live. It's only by examining um, dead animals that you can do um you can do research on, for example, how much carbon is stuck in the cartilage and to come up with some modeling. But um, yeah, they're very long lived and they can live to you know more than 100 years and probably 150. Which is crazy, by the way. I mean, there's very few creatures on this planet that live that yeah. long. Some of the great whales, uh, certainly among fish, I think that is unique, which is very, very neat. So great question, Ms. Lozell. Um, let's head to Ms. Perlowski's class with me here in Toronto. If you want to unmute your microphone, you are good to go. And then Ms. Firth, I'll come to you next, but you have to type in the chat bar because your, your mic's not working today for us. So Ms. Perlowski, come on in. <laughs> Hello, thank you. Um, we had two questions. Um, one was, um, what is the, like, is there like a main predator that would be um, the predator for the whale shark? Um, and then also, um, are there any effects of COVID? So like, can they get COVID? Um, and also, I understand that there may have been um, some information that um, that the oil, like there's some sort of liver oil from sharks that could be used. So is that something that could be putting them in danger right now that could, because it could be used for a vaccine? 
So thank you. Good questions. Um, about the predator, so it's yeah, it's a difficult question because again, um, whale sharks are not like whales, they don't wash up. They rarely wash up because they're made of cartilage, not bone. So uh, we'll never really find a dead whale shark unless it happened to die on the beach. So it's difficult to know the cause of death. But um, but as you've seen on some of, some of my pictures, often they get uh, bitten like little little bites uh, from from some sharks, especially um, little sharks that will just come and nibble at them when they're little. Um, but then when they get bigger, actually their their skin is so thick that no sharks wants to wants to put their teeth in there. So actually, that we know of, the only really predator is the orca. And that happens, you know, quite rarely and clearly not in the tropics because we rarely see orcas there. But um, I know it's happened in Mexico that uh, orcas targeted a whale shark. So that happens sometimes. But really, the biggest threat to whale sharks is man. <laughs> That's the sad truth about this. Um, about the other questions, I honestly don't know. I don't think whale sharks can get COVID. Um, I'm not aware of any research being done on this. Um, but the, the other problem really is that um, because whale sharks often are in tropical areas where you know people are poor and depend on fishing and depend on tourism, uh, like in Madagascar, because suddenly tourism has stopped. Like that's why I haven't been able to go. But also all the tourists usually coming in to, to see the whale sharks and to bring money to people so that they can eat and feed the family. Um, this has completely stopped. So so now we we've seen lots of cases where you know suddenly sharks are targeted. Um, thankfully in Madagascar, whale sharks are gone now. Their season is over. They're usually there from September to December, so they're elsewhere now, like you saw in the map, they're traveling. Um, so I don't think it's happened, but I'm aware of other sharks being, you know, targeted and dolphin species being targeted because people are just just running out of food, which is which is a big problem um, in those countries. About the squalene for the vaccines, um, I assume it would come from other sharks, um, but yes, that is a problem, but it's it's not. You know, already a lot of sharks are killed just for their flesh. I didn't talk of this so much, but um, there's a really high demand for fins from sharks. Um, it's it's an illegal trade. It's uh, it's happening mainly in China and in Asia, and uh, and you know, a really high number. I think it's a hundred million sharks um, are killed per year, not just whale sharks, all sharks, just for the fins or you know through the fisheries. So that's I mean, that's still going on regardless of COVID. It's actually even worse now because there's less regulation and um, all of these processes that are usually closely monitored, they're not so, so tracked these days because of the general chaos. Great questions, uh, Ms. Perlowski. So yeah, she mentioned squalene, so I'll bring that up on the banner below. So if you wanna look up things with regards to shark uh, materials being used for vaccines, that's what you're looking for below me. Um, in terms of things getting COVID, we get this question all the time from teachers now. Typically with any sort of virus, creatures can give it to creatures that are very similar to them. So that's why we've seen some mammals get it, some house pets, tigers and zoos, certainly the great apes, monkeys, primates like us would be able to get it. But typically the further you get, sort of evolutionarily away from any group, you're unlikely to be able to pass it on. You won't give it to your pet snake, for instance. Um, so cool question, guys. Um, and, and one, again, we get all the time. I'm going to take a few questions from YouTube and then come back to our live classes in just a minute. Uh, Miss Wu joining us in Houston, Texas, wants to know, they dive deep in the ocean and uh, in deep in the ocean. Uh, what do you think they're doing at that time? Hibernating? How are they able to survive that long without food? Yeah, great question, and it's you know it's a it's a, a mystery still uh, the the answer to this question for for most of us shark scientists because like I said, the tags have a limited uh, lifetime. Actually, usually it's about six months, um, so we only know you know if we tag them in Madagascar when they're feeding at the surface, we're only gonna like you saw on the map know for say a few months after, but we don't know much further than that. And actually, um, I think now a shark has been tagged for a year straight, but it's very recent. So it still is completely unknown what they do. Um, but what we think they do is um, they pretty much hibernate. <laughs> so they come feed at the surface and actually when they feed, it's for a few months long, you know, they will just stay in the area and feed, 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 like have <laughs> just all this food coming in. And then it, it's, seems after that they just kind of done and they they go offshore we don't see them anymore and uh, they will probably dive deep there's been 
Um, there's been studies thinking it might be to thermoregulate. So maybe, you know, they get so warm at the surface where it's 30 degrees, they need to go deeper when it's cold and stay there for a bit. There's other people saying they just hibernate and kind of shut down and just stay there. Um, other studies also suggest they might be needing different food. Like, you know, we need veggies and, um, proteins. Uh, I'm, I'm not explaining it right, but you know what I mean? We need different things in our diet and it might be they need uh, the plankton at the surface and other types of plankton um, at the bottom of the ocean, for example. So it might be another reason why they do that. Um, but it's still still a mystery and hopefully with technology improving, we can uh, we can track them uh, more. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's crazy to think that we know what's going on, you know, <laughs> on the moon, but we still don't know what whale sharks do for a year. <laughs> I love that uh, you know sentiment. It's something that we've seen with a lot of big animals in the world. There are still yeah. forest elephants that we don't really know their distribution, like large gorilla populations, blue whales, whale sharks, some of the biggest, most charismatic species on this planet. We have a very low amount of understanding about, which is really cool and I think sort of inspiring for kids who might want to go explore them themselves in the future. Mm. It's going to be very neat. Um, one more question from our, our YouTube folks, and then we'll come back for our live ones. Um, so there's been a lot of interest on in the spots. Are they born with spots? Why do they have spots? What's the deal? It's, it's sort of a very unique feature. <laughs> yeah, so actually many animals have spots. Um, you know, leopards or stripes like zebras. Um, there's a lot of other sharks that also have spots. Um, so the main, the main belief is that it's for camouflage. So actually, when you see a whale shark, in like you've seen in my pictures, it's it's really beautiful and it it's very striking. The spots that are light on the on the dark skin, but the moment they you know dive a few meters, you will lose track of the whale shark. Like it's crazy how well camouflaged they get. And at the same time, you might not see a whale shark, and suddenly it's like, oh, there's a whale shark there. I didn't see it. So it's probably because of camouflage. We think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Thanks, Stella. All right, Miss Stouffer's class. Let's go back to Florida. One more round with our live groups. Come on in, guys. Hi. Hi, my name is Kaylee. And what is your greatest memory with the whale shark? Uh, <laughs> I have many of them. It's um. <laughs> I have many, many of them, but there's been a few times where some whale sharks are very curious and you need to remember that um, while we see them and we recognize them, probably they don't recognize us. And some of the sharks we see, especially the smaller ones, they might be, you know, two meters long. They're, they're probably just, you know, seeing their first human. And that's that's something we forget. And it's um, it's quite special to to live that moment when they just really look at you like, what? are you? I haven't seen you before. And I had an, account, an encounter, um, uh, not last year, the year before with a really small shark. And it was just really curious what I was. And it just followed me, you know, but not in a scary way. It just, it just wanted to look at me and look at my fins and my equipment. And then after it just left and it was finished. And then we saw him again and he, he had understood we were not a threat. But um, it's it's very special to have these interactions with you know wild animals because if they want to stay with you they stay with you and if they do want to leave they leave but often they stay and and that's really nice and very special. Yeah. Very very cool. Great question, Miss Dopers class. All right, let's go back to Sudbury, Miss Lozelle. If you have another one for us, come on in. Yes, we do. We want to know what inspired you to become a marine biologist. If that's what. <laughs> So. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, I knew I always wanted to, you know, work with animals. Uh, initially, maybe you've read my article, but initially I wanted to be a vet, but I realized that wasn't for me because I want to be outdoors uh, in nature. That's really, really important to me. And it's it's kind of through really, um, yeah, identifying this place where there are whale sharks, but they're not studied. Actually, that's, I'm not sure I said in my talk, but that's how I stumbled upon the whale sharks. Um, I, I went out as a tourist and I saw them and I thought they were so beautiful, but I realized no work was being done. And that's that's something that happens uh, nowadays still a lot in science um, is that you have, you know, big research groups with lots of students or lots of staff and that study, you know, ARIA for a lot of years and they have great research and lots of things happening, but equally you have areas or places where nothing is done um, like in Madagascar, because it's far away, because it's a, 
uh, it's not always a safe place, but there's there's many reasons why I think it didn't happen before, and now and now it's I was I was lucky to make that happen, and I I really wanted as an individual to to make that contribution, and I felt I felt capable. So so really, I think it's important for all of you out there to know that you can also have initiative to start something. It doesn't have to be someone telling you, oh, you should study this. You can also have an idea and think it's a good idea and ask some advice around the people around you and the, the specialist and then go for it. Fantastic. I'm so glad when we get that question every time. A few people had asked it on YouTube as well, so we could sort of tell the, the backdrop mm -hmm. story. It's always lovely. Uh, Ms. Perlowski, I don't know what's going on with your camera, but I will come back in and check if you want one more. There we go. One more question with us uh, to wrap us up for the day. So come on in and unmute that mic. <laughs> All right. So um, actually, our other question was going to be about the spot. So you guys kind of got to that. So um, yeah, awesome. but thank you very much. This was really informative right. and super inspiring. Well, thank you so much. And I'm glad we got your spot question. We, we seem to answer a lot of questions that were asked otherwise. So that was really exciting in the backdrop. Um, I want to stress for everyone at home, in addition to being able to watch this broadcast again, we've done several other with amazing whale shark scientists at Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants. So do check those out on our YouTube channel. And if you want to find out more about Stella's project, check out MadagascarWhaleSharks.org. Amazing pictures, amazing videos and stories. So I hope you guys get the chance to do that when you're done. Stella, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. It's always it's always great fun sharing what I do, and and I really hope it um yeah it inspires people uh, to do to do more. <laughs> I think we've certainly got a lot of kids yeah. from across the continent, Illinois, Florida, Texas, Ontario, uh, and beyond. So what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our live teachers. I know a few of you are just teachers at home, but Miss Stouffer's class, I know you guys have a full class in today. So if everyone could join me and say a big thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>